Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Servants. Today we have a double whammy of two Gouda Gouda Goofy guys, Okada Izo and Sakamoto Ryoma. Now you may be asking yourself, why are we doing a twofer? Well, that's because Izo, though he is one of my favorite fake characters, has like no information on him. I believe that is an issue of me researching English sources primarily, as there is a chance that there is more available in Japan. However, we're going to work with what we have. As for Ryoma, I am fortunate enough to have some Japanese resources that I can use to research him better. But without further ado, let's look at our Bakumetsu bros. I lied. Before I begin, I want to recommend that you purchase and read Fate Redline. This follows the Guda Guda characters like Nobu, Izo, Ryoma, and has Okita as the main heroine. The setting is very much not Guda Guda though, and puts these usually goofy characters into a fairly serious plot about changing the future. It's great, the art is great, the story is well paced, Izo is terrifying in it, and Nobu is an absolute monster. I cannot recommend it enough, buy it, and support the author whenever it becomes available in a language that you can read it in. Okay. Now, seriously, back to the show. Let's begin with Izo. I have a personal soft spot for this puppy-like man-killer in Fate. He just has this air of Gouda Gouda goofiness that is offset by his incredibly brutal noble phantasm. I'm not the only one either, given that he was the most grailed servant on JP in 2018. But who was he really? Izo was born in Tosa on Valentine's Day of 1838 as the oldest son of a samurai. Much of his early life is shrouded in a mystery, but we know that he took up swordplay at a young age. He was initially self-taught, but would train under a man named Takeshi Hanpeta. Izo would travel with his new master, learning martial arts in Shugoku and Kyushu. He would also learn Kendo on his travels, further expanding his knowledge of the sword. Under his guidance, Izo would be taught in the style of Kyoshin Mechi Ryu in 1856. Perhaps Takeshi's biggest influence on Izo's life was recruiting him into his Sono Joy group. Now, this is a refresher for those of you who have not seen my Saito Hajime video. At this point in Japanese history, there was a divide among the people. There were those who were still loyal to the Tokugawa shogunate, such as the Shinsengumi, and then there were those who were loyal to the emperor and sought to overthrow the shogunate, the Sono Joy. What Sono Joy actually is, is a phrase that means expel the barbarians and revere the emperor. While the emperor at this time did hold some power, the shogunate was the true powerhouse of Japan. However, this did not sit well with many of the common folk, and the might of the Tokugawa's diminished with each passing generation. Couple this with the eventual arrival of Commodore Perry and the forced reopening of the country, two things the shogunate did unwillingly, making them seem weak, and tensions in Japan were pretty high. This is not to say that the Sono Joy wanted to welcome foreigners in with open arms, however. That was merely an add-on, as once the emperorship was restored, the slogan changed to Fukoku Kyohei, which means enrich the nations, strengthen the armies, and this sentiment is cited as a possible reasoning for the Japanese actions in World War II. However, that is speculation. Back to Izo, he willingly joined the anti-Tokugawa regime, though his name would later be redacted from their ranks for unknown reasons. Izo took up the all-familiar role of an assassin. Unfortunately, the details of his assassinations are limited. We have a list of his completed quarries and their occupations, so I'll run through that now. His first target was a man named Inoue Saichiro, who was something like an inspector general for soldiers. Then was Honma Seichiro. He also killed the following government officials. Ikeuchi Daigaku, Mori Magoruku, Ogawara Juzo, Otanabe Kinzan, and Ueda Jonosuke, all of whom worked under a Kyoto magistrate named Tada Tatawaki. He also publicly humiliated a man named Murayama Kazue by tying him up and throwing him off a bridge for all to see. Kazue would eventually die dangling there like a sick pinata. For all of his work, he would be dubbed a Hitokiri, which means manslayer, and he enacted all of these as a form of divine punishment which is one of the lines he yells during his noble phantasm. Also, it should be obvious, this title is why his first skill is called Manslayer. So, Izo is known as one of the four great assassins of the Bakumatsu period. The other three won't show up often in this video, but because it was something I myself was curious about, here is who they were. The four great assassins were Okada Izo, Kawakami Gensai, Tanaka Shinbei, and Kirino Toshiaki. So far, of these, only Shinbei has been seen in FGO aside from Izo, though he is an NPC. Come back to this video once he's a servant. It's around this time as well that Izo would come into contact with Ryoma, not as an assassin, however, but as a bodyguard. In 1863, he was tasked with protecting a man by the name of Katsu Kaishu. During this bodyguard duty, Izo would show off his incredible ruthlessness when he and his charge were ambushed by three would-be assassins. Izo immediately chopped one clean in half with a single swing and let out a hellish roar. 
scaring the other two so badly that they would run away screaming. Having now proved his worth, he would then be tasked with guarding a man called John Manjiro. Manjiro is one of the first Japanese people to visit America and would be a key figure in communication between the two countries. While the two were visiting a site that Manjiro had constructed, the pair were ambushed by two assassins. Manjiro initially wanted to run, but Izo stopped him from doing so. Izo had figured out that that was their plan, as he had somehow detected two more assassins lying in wait. Izo was able to easily dispatch the two he could see, and the other two fled, seeing that their plan had failed. It was now that Izo was at his peak as an assassin, but the good times would come to an end quickly and abruptly. First, he would be expelled from Kyoto on the charge of having tattoos. For the record, tattoos are frowned upon in Japan because historically criminals were given tattoos so that they could be identified for their crimes. More decorative tattoos would be used to hide the branding ones, so the idea of having tattoos at all during the time period makes you appear suspicious. Couple this to the Tokugawa ruled Kyoto losing its grip at this time, and removing all criminals that you could come across is honestly the best thing that you could do. Remember, Okita and the Shinsengumi were running around Kyoto arresting and killing anti-Tokugawa people, so it may have been a blessing in disguise. Well, it wasn't. Izo would be captured and convicted for the assassination of the regent of Tosa, Yoshida Toyo. This was a problem for the Sono Joy. This is touched on in FGO a little bit, but Izo was not well liked. He was incredibly good at what he did, but he was resented for his foul mouth and natural ability. Even his own master held this disdain and would have preferred that Izo would be killed rather than sent back to Tosa. In FGO, it is mentioned that Ryoma is a large proponent of Izo being executed. In reality, this pseudo sundere hatred he displays is from the real-life fact that Ryoma did nothing to save him. So, after days of being tortured to find out more members of the Sono Joy, Izo would be executed via beheading. This day of his death is forever immortalized in his Bansi. It goes as follows. People praised me, saying my swordsmanship was without compare. I thought so too, as nobody was able to best me. They all asked me to do it because they said I was the only one who could do it. And so, I wielded my sword, believing that. They all hailed me as the expert of divine punishment and threw piles of money at me, and I was ecstatic. Anyone who made fun of me before now cowered in fear and opened up the road for me whenever I passed by. That felt good. My sky was nice and clear. But eventually, the same folk started to look at me as if I were a dog. They talked about the state of the nation and other complicated stuff to keep me out of the loop. I didn't like that one bit. My sky was nice and clear, but it had started to cloud. Eventually, I was wandering around the capital all alone. I had no money and I was hungry. Even though the sky was still clear, I didn't want to do anything. I didn't care anymore. I don't know how and why things ended up like this. I don't know where I made any mistakes. I'm not so smart, so I must have messed up somewhere. No, I must not have made any mistakes from the start. I know I wasn't wrong when I was playing by the riverbed with my mates back in the day. It's a splendid sky. A sky so perfectly clear. So many of the Bonsies are just depressing as hell. He would be buried in his family grave in the mountains. He was only 27. But that is Izo, a much more chaotic, live fast, die young sort of character. Someone who believed that he was living the high life who was ultimately used as a cog for a much greater machine. Sakamoto Ryoma, however, was a much larger mechanism in this device. Sakamoto Ryoma was born on the 3rd of January, 1836, also in Tosa. Through hereditary tradition, Sakamoto was born a samurai, though a member of the lowest ranking caste of samurai known as Goshi. This is an honor that his family had actually purchased through being sake brewers. This is important to note as samurai were split into different social stratas. High-ranking samurai were known as Joshi, and low-ranking samurai were known as Kashi. The Sakamoto fell into the latter category. Tosa enforced a very strict segregation policy between these two social stratas. This would be something that would be very formative for Sakamoto as the years went on. Ryoma would be able to attend a private school when he was 12, but he was terrible at it and was bullied incessantly. So at the age of 14, he was removed and instead took up fencing in the Oguri Ryu style. He took to this significantly more, proving that sometimes standard education is not for everyone. He became a master of the sword, and in 1853, he would gain permission to travel to Edo, now Tokyo, to hone his abilities. He attended the Hokushin Ito Ryo Hyoho Chiba Dojo School, which was founded by one of the very last sword saints, a man by the name of Chiba Shusaku Narimasa, though this was not who Sakamoto trained under. Regardless, he was able to prove his mastery in swordplay and received a scroll certifying him as such. He would also receive the honorific title of Shinhan, which translates to Master Instructor, and he became a teacher at this school as well. Again, and I cannot stress this enough as a teacher myself, sometimes the regular path is not what you are meant for. Some people are meant to travel where the path is only a trail. 
and that is where they will find success. Do not take this as me saying, drop out of school and become a samurai, because that is not what I'm saying. Find what it is that you're good at and what you enjoy doing, and then do it. But having a GED in the States and elsewhere probably does help. Back to Ryoma, 1853 was a big year for him, and Japan for that matter, as that is the very same year that Commodore Perry arrived in Japan. The Tokugawa signed the Treaty of Kanagawa, which put them on blast because it made them seem weak to the common people and all the good stuff that I had mentioned earlier. In 1858, Ryoma would return to Tosa and become active in the Sonojoi movement, and would join as a member of Takeshi Hanpeta's group. This is where we see the connection between Izo and Ryoma. Though they shared a similar sentiment, Ryoma would leave Tosa again to pursue something larger. It had become abundantly clear that Takeshi's group wanted what was good for Tosa, while Ryoma wanted to improve Japan as a whole. Ryoma leaving Tosa was a huge deal for the time, as leaving one's clan was punishable by death. Thus, Ryoma took up the pseudonym Saitani Umetaro and began working against the Tokugawa in secret. Ryoma would befriend a man by the name of Katsu Kaishu, the same man who Izo would save from the three assassins. Initially, Ryoma had planned on killing him, but Kaishu was able to convince Ryoma of the importance of modernization, thus they became allies. Ryoma would end up fleeing Kagoshima as the Tokugawa began cracking down on dissenters in 1864. Two years later, Ryoma would play a key role as a neutral outsider to bridge a negotiation between two warring areas, the Koshu and the Satsuma, both of whom were anti-Tokugawa, but had been long-standing enemies. This treaty would be known as the Sacho Alliance. United, they had a very significant military force. To answer the question of why Ryoma is a rider, it actually goes beyond the fact that he rides on Oreo. Ryoma is cited as being the father of the Japanese Imperial Navy. He was a key proponent of modernizing the Japanese naval forces, using Western technology to bulk up their nautical warfare. Given that seafarers and captains are often depicted as riders, perhaps this is why he's a rider? Nah, it's probably just because he rides on top of Oreo, but it's a fun thought. On a side note, he also is the founder of Japan's very first corporation, Kayantai, which specialized in naval shipping. The members of the Sacho Alliance would win a decisive victory over the Tokugawa. This would make Ryoma's skills as a negotiator and a middleman incredibly important. This value outweighed the fact that he was meant to be killed for abandoning his clan, and they welcomed him back into Tosa, albeit on shaky ground. They wanted Ryoma to essentially tell the Tokugawa to go off themselves so that the Sacho could fill the gap and possibly receive honors and power from the Emperor. However, Ryoma opted for the more peaceful resolution, and helped negotiate the Shogun, Tokugawa Yoshinobu, into stepping down from his position, bringing the Shogunate to an end and beginning the Meiji era. However, Ryoma's life would not go the quiet path of, say, Saito Hajime. Rather, his time would be cut short in an incident that would be known as the Omiya Incident. At the Omiya Inn, before the Meiji era had officially started, Ryoma was staying with an associate named Nakaoka Shintaro, and his bodyguard, a former sumo wrestler named Yamada Tokichi. When night fell, a group of assassins knocked on the door and asked if they would be permitted to visit with Ryoma. Given his notoriety, this was not an uncommon thing, so Yamada told them he would go ask Ryoma if he was willing to take visitors during the late hour. When his back was turned, the assassins slashed him fatally and rushed in. They burst in through paper walls and knocked over lamps, and a brawl in the dark ensued. By the time it was over, both Ryoma and Shintaro were badly injured. Ryoma would die soon after the fight, lamenting that he had been caught unprepared. Shintaro would follow soon after him, succumbing to his injuries two days later. The assassins were never identified, however, it was believed that it was members of the Shinsengumi that killed them. In fact, this is why Kondo Isami, the leader of the Shinsengumi, was executed. This turned out to be false, however, and another pro-Tokugawa group, the Mimawari Gumi, admitted to the assassinations, essentially saying that the death of Kondo Isami was pointless, save for his views. But that is where Sakamoto Ryoma's life ends, not being able to see the final product of all of his work. However, he is not the only part of his depiction in Fate. There's also Oreo. Oreo's real name was Narasaki Ryo, but she was most commonly called Oreo. She was something of a hero herself, being Ryoma's savior during an assassination attempt known as the Teradaya Incident. Oreo worked at the Teradaya Inn in Kyoto. One night, while she was bathing, she heard a voice outside her window discussing a plan to kill Sakamoto Ryoma, who was staying at the inn. Suddenly, a spear punctured the wall above Oreo's shoulder. Rather than freak out, 
She grabbed it with one hand and stood up yelling at the person who did it. She then put on an untied bathrobe and pursued her would-be attacker into the garden in almost full nudity. She then rushed up the stairs to where Ryoma was staying with his bodyguard and warned them of what was to come. The trio then fought their way out of the inn, surviving but being slightly injured. To heal from these wounds, Oreo and Ryoma traveled to various hot springs around Kagoshima, all of which were said to have healing properties, effectively inventing the honeymoon in Japan. To put it bluntly, she was a badass. As for the dragon aspect of her, it's twofold. For one, the Ryo kanji in her name is the kanji for dragon. Two, there is a legend that exists around a certain mountain that Ryoma visited. There is a spear called the Amano Sakahoko, which rests in a mountaintop, said to be the very spear used by Izanagi and Izanami to stir the great ocean and create Japan. This is the spear that both Lancer Ryoma and Eris use. Supposedly, Ryoma climbed the mountain and pulled up the spear just to see if he could do it. That is a real anecdote. The next one is not corroborated by any historical evidence. But, according to FGO, this action unleashed Oreo, who initially planned on eating Ryoma. But, his carefree attitude about the situation made her fall in love with him. Of course, that's just a story. It's truly difficult to imagine just how influential a person is on history until you look into the nitty gritty of them. Izo and Ryoma serve as two sides of the same coin. The same ideologies, but different approaches. Izo believed in the philosophy of might makes right, while Ryoma believed in diplomacy. Both were masters of the sword and geniuses in their own rights, and both died in pursuit of their beliefs. I'll leave it to you to decide whose approach was the better one. It's Oreo's. Yay! But that's it! Okada Izo, Sakamoto Ryoma, and Oreo in the books. Thank you all so much for watching. Let me know what you thought in the comments. Like the video if you enjoyed it, as it really does help out the channel. Subscribe to catch these as they go up. Check out the playlist for more content like this. Leave a comment on who you want me to cover in the future so I can add them to my doc. But until next time, keep your chin up. Peace.